sleep shape. So if something goes wrong with the algae, everything else breaks down. The whole ecosystem because breaks down, you see? So in the field right now, you don't see any algae. So that's why you don't see any So, so if you don't see any algae, you don't see the it's shells that feed on algae. If you don't see the shells that feed on algae, you don't see the shells that feed on shells. That feed on so that. That feed on gel, that feed on gel. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why what is remarkable in the field, you don't see any of that right now. You saw only that before the open. University of Louisiana Lafayette and I work on seaweed, seaweed biodiversity in the Gulf uh, predominantly and we've done a lot of work after the oil spill because uh, the northwestern Gulf of Mexico is incredibly rich in algae uh, that live on those salt domes in the, the hot banks uh, and this is around um, 45 to 80 meters depth. This is absolutely a wonderful area uh, before the oil spill, that is very rich in um, the northwestern Gulf of Mexico. But as you see here, uh, a lot of those nodules, uh, the rubble, the rhodolites, that were um, so completely covered by algae before the oil spill, when we go out in the field now and we dredge around um, 60 to 80 meters, this is what we see. Everything looks dead. Not a single algae, hardly any alga is found on its seaweeds. Eh? So what we did, we, it was really um, very frustrating because we've, we've been five times now since the oil spill. Uh, we've been dredging there and basically this is what we see when things, the dredge comes up. Everything looks dead in the, in the, in the field. But what happens when we take those nodules and we put them in... Um, tanks, or water tanks, with the same water uh, at the same depth that we collected it in those tanks as you see here. After a couple of weeks what, what comes out is the whole biodiversity of algae starts to bloom again. So you see all of that for example, those nodules were basically completely looking dead when we picked it up. And after a couple of weeks, this is from this is from November 16, 2012, from Fish Haven, everything starts to grow again. And what is so remarkable is that the biodiversity that we see now uh, completely re uh, is the biodiversity that was there in the same size before the Oscar. Specialize in uh, mollusks, uh, seashells, and uh, I have been uh, going in the Gulf of Mexico since 1994 on the research uh, vessel, the Pelican. Uh, so what I am doing with the GRI is that uh, I'm trying to uh, equate what we have been collecting in earlier years to what we are collecting now in terms of. Uh, a number of species, different uh, species, uh, the abundance, etc. Uh, I uh, then uh, classify them, identify them, and compare them with other uh, times when we have gone in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, uh, what you're seeing now is one drawer of many, many drawers. Uh, we have collected about uh, uh, nearly 4,000 lots of shells since the pelican began, not for the GRI, but since the pelican began. So I have a good uh, way to compare what we have done before with what we're doing now. Uh, the species, and I'm talking now about mollusks, not algae or crustaceans, but the species that we have been collecting in deep water uh, seem to be relatively the same as before the oil spill. Uh, however, the banks that uh, we have studied are much, much poorer than they were before. And uh, uh, we have done it again about three times already, and it doesn't seem so far to improve. My colleagues, the patient and algae, 
what's happening in crustacean algae that's happening with uh, models too so it's all pretty uh, uh, pretty parallel <laughs> What we dredge, uh, the little nodules, they look completely dead. Eh? And we have a lot of the, we also put them for DNA sequencing and whatever. Uh, we have, uh, we keep them in silica gel. And what is so nice about um, our research is that we have so much data uh, where we collect the same nodules, the same rhodolites, the little stones before the oil spill. Eh? So we can really. Uh, compare, we have a beautiful uh, way of comparing what happened, uh, the algae that were there before the oil spill and after the oil spill. And so that's what we're working on. We, um, we look at um, the biodiversity. Everything is like in a way of uh, dormancy. And something triggers it that it grows in our tanks based on the same water because we get the same water um, at the same depth from where we get those basically dead looking nodules and we have it here. So we are trying to understand what happens, what triggers those algae to grow here, and why don't they do it in the The effect Gulf. of the bacteria are very important. Uh, it's the effect of uh, the nutrients, the herbiv herbivory. It's, mm -hmm. it's very, very complex, much more complex than we were thinking. At, at and every time we go in the Gulf, we have completely new ideas. So it's really a work in progress. Because every time we go, we learn new things. We learn what grows, what doesn't grow, uh, what is the cycle, because you see the cycle here. It goes through uh, basically life and going through the life cycle, then it disappears again, and then it grows back up. Huh? Exactly like what happens in the uh, in, um, natural environment. Huh? It's really, really interesting. Because you see all of that? More, a lot of those uh, algae. We have about like 60, 70 different species growing into those tanks. Okay? But when we get them, they are not there. So there is something, uh, we think those little uh, nodules are like seed banks, because when we crack them open, there's a whole bunch of spores and little propagules and then when the, uh, that are there. And they, they are like in a cryptobiosis state, mm -hmm. like a uh, dormant state, and the conditions are right, and boop, everything starts to grow again. So it's a wonderful adaptation. Those gastropods, we didn't, when we picked them up, they were not with the, the, in the water, they were not on there. So th they must have been in the larval stage, the veliger stage. Yeah. You see? And somehow then the conditions were right and they start growing in here. Just like the algae, so it's something right. that again uh, so suppresses they, they their growth <coughs> in the field, and here, psh, yeah, and, and these these are herbivorous, these it's these shells. So what I'm doing is, right now, we have samples from Paisanella that we collected post-oil spill. When we went past the oil spill, basically all we had left were encrusting algae like Paisanella and some coral. And they were ones that were still surviving and somewhat healthy. So we wanted to examine why these certain algae are surviving while the other ones are not surviving. Like if you want to see here, you can look at here. These are examples of some, like the red crusts. These guys survived quite well after the, the oil spill. So what we're doing is we had a partial genome before the oil spill happened, and now we're building with that genome, and with that genome that will be a backbone for doing transcriptomic studies, which is what's being expressed by the algae at that time, what genes are being expressed. So once we find out what's being expressed, we can see how the algae is reacting to the oil spill, and hopefully figure out how it's survived, basically, and if we can see it with any other systems. Um, I'm doing the, the transcriptomic work and everything like that, assembling it, going through, extracting, learning that process right now, but it's still happening. But Dago Berto Venera Punton and 
another graduate student, um, Sherry Krajewski, is also doing physiological studies with that, that we're going to complement the work with. So we're going to have the physiology, we're going to have the transcriptome, and we're going to have the genome. Hello, um, my name is Dagoberto Venera, and I'm also a lab member in Susan Frederick's lab. Uh, my main research interest is related with um, the effects of the oil on the genetics of algae, particularly on gene expression. And what I'm basically trying to do is to evaluate how the oil and the dispersant called Corexit affects the gene expression in algae, what genes are expressed, and what genes get repressed when there is oil. So what I'm basically trying to do is I'm going to do a very simple experiment in where I'm going to set up some algae in small containers and in some of the containers the algae is going to be just in seawater, in others the algae is going to have a water plus oil like in the conditions where, where there is an oil spill. In other containers the algae is going to have corexit, in others it's going to be the algae plus the seawater of, of course, corexit and the oil because you know in the when the oil spill happened uh, in the middle of the of this big mess what happened is is the algae there the oil and then they add the corexit so basically it's the effects of all together and then see the gene expression profile to see and then at the end when we see the gene expression profiles we will be able to identify some genes that are sensitive to oils genes that are sensitive to corexit and based on what we know on the functions of the gene, we can infer on what processes of the algae are affected. And that's basically my main research interest. Okay, I'm George Reese. I'm an undergraduate research assistant. I'm a freshman here at the university. I help the other lab members with their research. I do things such as DNA extractions, you know, helping them with their samples. But I also have my own research project. I deal mainly with green algae, and I focus on the genus Codium, which is this right here. Um, we also have an interesting one right here. Um, I uh, compare different samples from around the world, places like the Red Sea. Uh, we have some samples from Japan, Gulf of Mexico, and we'll be getting more. Um, but I compare those to samples we have in the tanks that germinated after the oil spill, samples collected there. And this summer, based on my research, I'll be giving a presentation at the ISS conference in Florida. <laughs> So the idea is to get the, C the DNA sequences and then we do the alignment and this is the uh, sequences we get and we work on them and then we align many sequences together to create the trees and to see where is the evolutionary relationship between them and to compare those relationships with the uh, gulf, uh, algae from the Gulf to before the oil spill and after the oil spills mm -hmm. and also from the Gulf to other parts. For example, these ones that have reproductive structures, then we try to get to the nest life cycle stage, for example, so we take the reproductive part and we isolate it in these petri dishes over here and then we wait until the little babies grow up and that's what I'm going to do. So this is what we have been found. So this was the first. These are the first stages where they are pretty young. And then they start growing a little bit more. Then they grow more. And these are the last pictures we took two days ago. So I'm going to take more pictures right now. So these are the little colonies after we isolate the reproductive parts of the plant. Okay. <laughs> to see what we are seeing in the microscope, we can see it on here. So this is so far what we've been getting. And another graduate student in our lab is actually analyzing the rotoliths from the Gulf of Mexico for their components. So 
these rotoliths we have in this area are a conglomerate of different forces. So we have some that are composed of the coralline algae, calcite, and everything like that. And other ones are produced by bacteria. So we're trying to figure out which side, how much of the rotolith is bacterial component, how much is um, coralline component. Who bacteria. is actually making the calcium carbonate? And that's important for the calcium, I mean, the carbonite cycle of the earth and carbon fixation. And also trying to figure out, since most, some of the bacteria are influenced, uh, get their energy source from hydrocarbons to produce the calcium carbonate, that this is also another important factor to understanding what is going on with the rotoliths in the Gulf of Mexico. Just here Frederick's lab. And what we're trying to do is to determine what the rotoliths that were collected before and following the oil spill are um, full of, what they're made from. And by doing that, we'll be able to answer a couple of questions, how they were made, what types of organisms made them, if those organisms were affected by the oil, if there's heavy metals that are involved that aren't normally present in the Gulf. Those kinds of questions can be answered. And then what other types of questions we haven't yet uh, explored, I'm sure we'll come up with more questions as we come up with more answers. And the tool that we're going to use to do this is a scanning electron microscope. And basically what happens is we shoot electrons at these samples, which are rotoliths, which is what you're seeing. And then the uh, electrons inside the sample are excited and they basically bounce back and are collected and then actually give us First of all, a picture, it's a 3D picture, so you see the surface that's highly magnified, but also we can use it to uh, do what we call a spectrum analysis, and the spectrum analysis will tell us which elements are present. <coughs> and so this is really what a spectrum analysis looks like. This one's just a test, just to sort of start, and it tells us then um, the amount of the particular element, the intensity, the significance or error that you know, in other words, what is the probability that the number we have is actually accurate? So we can say, yes, this is what's in here. And then by testing several different places on each sample, we can make a, a firm statement about what's in each sample. And so that's what we're going to do. And uh, so that's the start. And then I got about 19 other things to do, too. My name is uh, Thomas Sauvage, I'm a PhD student here, and uh, I work mostly on green algae of the other uh, Bryopsidaris. Uh, here we have, for instance, uh, some Chloropath species. Uh, some uh, of these species in this uh, genus are extremely invasive, such as uh, Chloropath uh, taxifolia that was introduced in the Mediterranean and then later in California and cost a lot of lots of money to be uh, mitigated. And uh, some of the work, uh, they can look the same sometimes, and some of the work we're doing in the Gulf is trying to uh, clarify the species that are there that may look the same as this uh, invasive. For instance, here we have three different species, and then you can see that. Yeah, and after the oil spill, these uh, have disappeared. So uh, now I'm working on older specimens, herbarium specimens, to try to get DNA sequences and then clarify the identity of these species. We don't know. We've been there since it was in August 2010. Right. It's now it's got, it's 2013, March 2013, and it still hasn't recovered. Actually, it gets worse. Uh, oh, right away. Well, the, uh, the first time we went out was in December 2010. There was some algae that were gelatinous. So this little beauty, like do, it's a very primitive group of green algae, and that was really abundant right after the oil spill. First time we went. And since then, we haven't seen it anymore. But you see, it's gelatinous, so the oil can basically not get it. 